I'm Peter Trippi. I'm editor-in-chief of Fine Art Connoisseur magazine. I'm based in New York City, and I'm delighted to be co-hosting this first of several conversations among artists, dealers, and other opinion leaders in the art world. Uh, this is an extraordinary time in our history, so I thought that we should get together and trade ideas and information and images. I want to introduce my co-host, Katie Whipple, the artist based in New York City as well. Hi, Katie. Hi. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here with us. It's a pleasure. Um, I think that it would be fun for us to introduce ourselves. We've got three great talents here on the screen with us. Um, I'll begin just to say, in addition to being editor-in-chief of Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine, I'm an independent guest curator of exhibitions of mostly historical art. Uh, I'm working currently with Historic New England in Boston on an exhibition that opens this fall of paintings primarily from the 19th century. Katie, would you like to say something about yourself? Um, sure. I am a painter uh, based in New York City. Um, I am also associated with the Grand Central Atelier, where I wear many hats, um, uh, mostly doing more development roles there right now, as well as teaching. And um, yeah, mostly, mostly just a painter of flowers. <laughs> Great. Mario. My name is Mario Robinson, and I'm a watercolorist working in the American tradition, and I've been a professional painter for 26 years, and I'm excited to join you. Alia? Hi, I'm Alia Elbermani. I am a primarily figurative painter now living in North Carolina. Um, I opened up my own teaching studio a few years ago called Alia Fine Art Studios, and also was a co-founder of One in Painting Women. And yeah, just painting and drawing away. Laura. Hi, um, I'm Laura Grenning, and oh. I have had the Grenning Galleries for 23 years now. Um, I was actually originally an art student at the Florence Academy of Art, and I was so blown away by what they were doing. Um, I came back and showed, I bought a bunch of paintings and showed my friends and couldn't stop talking about the work. And frankly, I don't have the patience. I, I think what painters do is kind of spectacular um, and it takes a lot of patience and care. And I just don't have the patience to stay in a studio. But I have been, um, and I've known Peter for gosh, many years. <laughs> um, and anyhow, the Grinning Gallery is, um, is based in Sag Harbor. We've had different iterations, either Palm Beach or New York City. But right now we are hunkered down in Sag Harbor, New York. Well, glad to see you all. This is a thrill. Um, I miss you. It would be fun to be together at a party, but we're going to make it a little bit of a Zoom party. Uh, there is no wrong answer. It's very informal. The idea is just to talk through a few ideas related to uh, what's happening now. Uh, specifically, in our chats, I, I think that we might want to address issues like, how are things going for you and your colleagues during this pandemic? Uh, can you please provide some examples of frustrations and successes? Um, what do you see on the horizon for you, your activities, and the field of contemporary realism next month, three months from now, next year? We can talk way down the road if you want. Um, and also, how can people watching this program support you, the people you know? How can the viewers of this program make a difference to the future now? What exactly is on offer in terms of purchasing works of art or checking out webinars, doing workshops online, any of that is fair game. So we'll talk it all through in the next hour. Uh, I thought it would be smart to zoom in on uh, specific images from some of you uh, so that we can see what you're working on, what you're handling now. Uh, we'll, we'll begin with Alia. Uh, that's Dale's cue to put up the slide deck, uh, which is um, just some well tasters of what she's been working on. There we go. Great. Yeah. Okay, take it away, my friend. Uh, there's a slide coming. The next slide should be, yeah, that's a work of art. Gorgeous. There we go. Um, so this painting was part of a solo show um, a little more than, well, actually it was about a year ago now that was five months after the passing of my mother. And so the whole show, it was called like Sound Through Water. Um, 
and it was an intense moment in my life trying to not lose the opportunity to have a solo exhibition while also processing grief. Um, and it sort of, I sort of felt like I was a journalist or a scientist examining myself through this process. Uh, and this piece came, came about because I was struggling to find that balance as my mom got sick of being a mother and taking care of my mother. She lived in Massachusetts and my family's in North Carolina. And so for months I was apart from my children. And so when I finally got back to North Carolina, the thing I craved most was that connection with my children. And this is my daughter. Um, but I also was processing that grief. And so there was that missing connection of my mother as well. So for, the, for me, this, this painting and the windows became a symbol for seeking connection. Um, and that fog that I was in, in that moment. Uh, the windows have now stuck with me. And if we can dance to the next slide, we can move into more current, current work. So now I've had a little more time to process grief. Of course, it never leaves us, but um, the windows themselves have, have become a symbol for um, both our own varied perspectives and how that can be shifting and different for each of us, um, as well as just a, a physical barrier that obstructs our view or confuses our view. Um, so it's, it's multifaceted and, and I think there still is that kind of grief uh, in, included in this. Um, I'm not sure what that feedback is. I don't know if you guys are hearing that. Uh, I do hear it. Uh, maybe Mario can turn off his, um, uh, mute his sound and I will do the same. And that should eliminate everybody but, but our speaker. Okay, let's try. Okay. Okay, so we'll, we'll um, yeah, so this one is titled Disrupted View, and I painted this model twice, one in front of the mirror, I mean the um, window and one behind the window, and they, I think of them as sister, sister pieces, and it's both how we look out at the world with our own set of perspectives, and, and there's a varied view of how, how we're perceived as well. Um, just kind of interestingly, this, uh, she became a scholarship student for me in my studio and her mother is now in New York. So she is, is just about 18, maybe not even quite 18. And she's taking care of all of her siblings while her mother is a traveling nurse in New York, caring for so many in New York. So I, I think um, as this pandemic has happened, the, the work has taken on different meanings as well. We can move on to the next slide. So all of this work, um, this new work after that first painting, Adrift, um, is for a show that opened the week before North Carolina shut down. Uh, it's a two-person show at the Mahler Gallery called Common Thread or Threads. I, we go back and forth whether it should be plural or not. Um, this was the first piece that I painted for, for this exhibition. And again, I only gave myself five months for, for creating this work, which I don't recommend for any artist out there. Um, but this one really, I think, captures that idea of feeling contained and vulnerable and the, how windows um, can reflect and also conceal. And, and for me, I, it was really important important for me to paint these works from life. So I installed all these um, dirty old windows in my studio and had the models come in and paint from life. And that interaction and that time with the model was so, so valuable with me. And then when they weren't there, I was working on the windows um, and, and developing the painting that way. Okay, we can switch to the next one. So here's that other sister piece for, for um, the other one of the same model. This one is titled Single Thread. And there's, I love words. So I always try to create, um, the titles always have meanings in my work. 
Um, and this one, even though there's two images of threads in the painting, it's titled single thread. So for me, it's that other plane of existence that potentially exists. So in the very first painting adrift, I was seeking that connection to my mother who was in my mind somewhere else. Um, and that thread in this window could either be a reflection, but it's not quite exactly the same. So is it on the other side of the window? And that ambiguity becomes really fascinating to me in my own work and when I view other work as well. And so I seek, seek it, even in just a portrait. Okay, we can switch to the next one. And then this, um, I think, is a final image from this body of work. There's more that is at the gallery, Muller Fine Art. They've, the, the gallery has been under quarantine as well. Um, I'm not sure how we'll proceed with that. I think they're going to have the exhibit up once everything starts opening up again for some time. Um, yeah, and then this one, the title it means something different today than it did the day that I painted it. So unseen connections. Um, I was more interested in our similarities. I think our society right now is putting people in boxes. And I don't mean that in the Zoom Hollywood Squares fashion. I mean, um, we're all categorizing each other. And I want to celebrate the things that we are more similar for because there's more that we are connected with than that we are not. Um, and, and so here is, is an example of the window. They're sneaking under it. it it's no longer a barrier. Um, the exciting thing that, about being in North Carolina right now, or, you know, I've been here for 10 years now, the support that North Carolina has been giving its artists is incredible. I am so blown away. I, I moved here from Los Angeles, which is a much bigger pool. Um, I do miss that strong figurative community of Los Angeles, but the, there's so much um, more ingrained support, everything from like restaurant workers supporting artists and our artists supporting restaurant workers um, and funding being created. The, the very day the um, shutdown happened here in North Carolina, six nonprofits got together and created a fund and now they've given over $80,000 to artists directly, no strings attached. Um, I am so grateful to be in a place that values the arts, um, it, both dance, music, theater, all of it. Um, and the, piece um, Disrupted View is now in contention for the Raleigh Municipal Collection. So they can't have their um, open to the public meeting yet. So they, even uh, with questions of access to the internet, you can't consider Zoom a public meeting. So once they are able to have their public meeting, they'll be able to put the gavel on it. Um, but that, I mean, that kind of support is just invaluable to me uh, as an artist. I feel appreciated, I feel seen. Uh, I, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, if we wanna advance to the next slide, I think this is just kind of capturing um, links for that show that I was talking about, kind of price range overall, my, all my teaching. I've had to really quickly learn how to um, go from being able to draw on somebody else's drawing and take all my information and put it online and connect. Still, I still want it to feel like a um, embracing community and um, classroom. So I'm teaching now on Zoom and it's, there's so many wonderful things about that platform that I can stress that I can't take the time to in a classroom. So there's, there's push and pull for, for each situation. Um, so you're welcome to go online and um, to my website and find those online classes that I'm offering. They're all being recorded and will be kind of bundled up and packaged later for consumption at your pace. Um, and then if we ever <laughs> come out of uh, lockdown, there's future workshops, including one with Mario um, later this year. Hopefully we'll be able to do it. Uh, and yeah, and then subscribe to my newsletter because if any future, um, if I do an auction, I'm, I'm really thinking about doing an auction 
to give to that North Carolina Artist Relief Fund. Um, so how, how can I support my own community back? Um, that newsletter will be the way that you can find all of my information for websites and Instagram upcoming events. So thanks for having me. This is such a Thank you. That's very helpful to get an overview of what's going on with you. And I think I was taking notes madly and we'll come back to some questions and comments for you shortly. Let's move the slide forward, please, to Laura's set, uh, maybe even to the next one. Uh, and Laura, please tell us what we're seeing. Oh, hey, um, this is, so um, I'm here in Sag Harbor. We're kind of at the epicenter. Um, the Suffolk County, New York has seen a big drop off, but Suffolk County is still growing as far as the number of positive tests. And I went to the doctor this morning just for regular um, uh, checkup, and they told me eight out of 25 people are testing positive when they're coming in. I know, that's a big number, I thought. <laughs> So um, anyhow, we are, I, I, I actually um, had a, a, a meeting by appointment this morning. We've had, I would say, um, two to three meetings by appointment um, uh, in the last couple of weeks. For, uh, for a month and a half, nobody was doing anything. And um, Sag Harbor is a beach town, and we are a week away from Memorial Day weekend. And this part of New York State is still very much locked down. We're not supposed to be open, but I've noticed that people are opening by appointment up and down Main Street. So, um, but I, I actually have to report that I've had a better uh, March and April this year than last year. Um, and I think, you know, I've also been talking with a lot of my painters. Um, I don't know, it, there, there are three artists in this Zoom, so you guys can answer this personally, but m what I'm hearing from the artists is they are very relieved that there is absolutely no distraction. Um, the, what they're doing is basically hunkering down in, a, in their home or in their studio or both, um, and they're making lots and lots of paintings. Um, and uh, what I'm seeing, the work that I'm seeing coming back out is um, more in depth and uh, a little more personal. So um, this, a lot of my artists, uh, uh, see this as a, a time um, of peace and where they're able to work harder. I'm actually personally having an interesting experience. I don't have any of that FOMO. You know, I'm normally moving around a lot. And Peter, I see you nodding your head. <laughs> you know, I, I uh, am addressing a lot of the ideas that I've had, creative ideas for my business. I'm actually sitting here and doing it. Um, and uh, we're having very good results. We're also at the end of a, <clears throat> a two-year effort to be much more online. We have a first dibs um, and an artsy uh, um, account, uh, galleries, whatever, presence, yeah. And we have a very big um, website, which I, I spent quite a bit of money four or five years ago making sure that all of our inventory could be accessed on the, on the website. So we actually use that as an inventory management tool um, and so that has been very helpful. Um, we, uh, what, what I'm finding is a couple, a lot of my, from the client side, so that's what's happening with the artists. Um, from the, some of the artists though who have young children are, are a little um, unable to work. <laughs> um, but for the, um, the clients, what I'm, I got a call about two weeks into this from a client up in Southampton who was like, I am going out of my mind. My, my husband's in finance. He's on the phone in the, in the office all day long. I really want to see this one painting. Um, and, there's, and I got on the phone with her. We went through the website. She picked five or six paintings she liked. And I, I put my M95 mask on and my gloves. And I went over there. And this is, I think we were still in March, or early April. She lived with them for a week or two. And she ended up buying one. Um, and the same thing happened two weeks later, a major uh, a client wanted to look at one little painting. We found five or six things. They, sh they, they walked me around their house with the FaceTime. We found, we brought six paintings. This is almost in New York and it's, it, it's way like calmer and quieter. It's, it's almost like funereal when you get closer to New York City. Well, you know, Peter, you're in the city, right? It's just, it's very sad. 
Um, and anyhow, I brought those paintings in and we hung them in the house and they bought five out of the six paintings because my clients are home and they're looking at, they're not spending money traveling and they're looking at the blank wall. They're there just like I am in my business. They're finally addressing things. Um, so it's been pretty good. Um, and, uh, and the other thing is, you know, I don't know if you guys remember, well, most of you won't, but maybe, maybe Mario and Peter were a little older. <laughs> there was a time or there are galleries that just don't open to the public. You actually need an appointment or you need to, uh, you know, when you ask the question, what do you see going forward? I, I think for that will be the way we will have to operate, at least here in New York, going forward for the next year. And I am not going to have a problem with that. I can get so much more work done by not engaging with everybody who happens to bumble in here. Now, having said that, I'm, that's how I meet 50% of my new clients, but they're still going to see me through the window. I don't know if you can see, but that, that's where I'm sitting. That's Main Street, Sag Harbor. <laughs> so I can still see people. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> that's kind of what I think is happening from the artist perspective, from the client's perspective, my business. Um, <clears throat> I am going to probably talk to first dibs and try to renegotiate because the higher value paintings are selling and I don't think they should be getting 18%. Um, that's a big number and everyone on first dibs wants 25% off to start. But those, those things are all negotiable. Now, what we're looking at on the screen is, um, this is Ben Fenske's painting, Clouds Building. This is the major painting from last summer. Um, this is uh, done uh, with the prismatic palette, which I discussed on Instagram. Oh, that's the other thing. We've been doing little videos on Instagram to go more in depth about the art that's in the gallery. And that seems to be um, definitely resonating with our clients. So you can find it at Grenning Gallery, Instagram page, or even we have a YouTube channel. Um, but this is uh, Ben Fenske. This is Ben is one of my top painters. He's having an opening on August 29th. We have our schedule and it is all systems go. We had an opening last Saturday night for Carl Bretzky. You can kind of see, well, you can see the two paintings behind me. Uh, we sold eight of his paintings before the opening night because we went, we were marketing as if we were having an opening. We rehung the show. We walked around and we had, um, we hand delivered and mailed out these little cocktail um, invitations with these little, um, I'll show you, let me see. Oh, right here little kettle one um, things. We wrapped them up with Grenning Gallery, you know, sticker, and it looked like a Grenning Gallery painting because we put two in the package. And um, I had about 15, 20 clients come from all across the, the world, actually. And um, somebody bought something right after, somebody's interested in one, and somebody bought something right before. So, um, so we are having a show for Ben Fenske on um, August 29th. Uh, he just sent me a few images because we had a client in this morning looking at his work. Um, I, there's a lot more finished work now than there would have been at this time because he would have been winging around going to different, um, d either teaching different workshops or just traveling. Uh, so I, uh, I'm very excited about his show coming up. This is, um, in, in fact, his work is selling so well and I see uh, um, that clients are looking for larger paintings. This painting is um, priced at a level that's going to change. If this painting is still here, um, it's going to be uh, more expensive in two months. That's what's happening is clients are buying larger paintings um, in general. We can go to the next slide. So, um, uh, Peter, do you have any questions? No, fantastic. Thank you very much for all these insights. That's just great. Keep going. We'd love okay. to see more slides. Okay, this painting is gonna always be the pandemic painting of the year for me. It's called Bungalow Comfort. And this is, um, this is by Carl Bretzky, who we just had the opening for. His stuff is selling very well. He's a relatively new artist to me. He was a, a group show artist for a couple of years and we gave him his first solo, solo show last year. He's had another uh, solo show that we just hung now that's already doing well. Um, he, uh, Carl Bretzky also studied, uh, Carl Bretzky and Ben Fenske both studied with um, uh, Joe Paquette in uh, Minnesota. And Joe uh, and I have had a lot of really interesting conversations. I don't know, Peter, do you know Joe Paquette? 
You should know him. Yes, I do. I do. He's yeah, so he's great. Yeah. So, so one of the amazing things about Karl Bretzky's this painting is it shows it's it's like that old luminist um, uh, 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 tonalist kind of tradition of the the wild landscape with the warm uh, note of a human inside a inside a home sheltering in in place and sheltering in place is what we've all been doing. And this is, looks like a snowy day in Minnesota. And um, you've got uh, all the different colors of light. You've got the, um, that white light behind the house. You've got the warm light inside the house. You've got the reflected light on the little shed between the two buildings. Um, but then you've got the, this um, car that's like zipping by. It's really hard for classical artists to show movement. Classically trained artists are really used to studying one, um, you know, getting the elements exactly as they are at one moment in time. Um, but this is a classically chained painter who is showing movement. Um, and I, I just think he has, it, it's such a brilliant picture. Um, and it will always remind me of this period where we've all been sheltered at home. You can do the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you can do the next one. Oh, this is Victor Budko. So Victor, um, so Carl's show is up until June 1st. Victor is, um, his show opens on June 27th. And this is a bright and beautiful image called Docks at Deering Harbor. And it is done on plein air behind uh, Jack's Marine on Shelter Island. And it's looking out at a very traditional Deering Harbor um, scene. That's the um, Shelter Island Yacht Club in the distance. And beyond that, you would see Greenport. Um, one of the things that's great about Victor, I got, I, Victor came to me through um, the Russian American Painting Alliance that Ben Fensky and I founded in 2016. He had been invited to Russia with a couple of my other painters and we invited a bunch of those painters back. They painted in, in um, Maine and for a month and then down here for a month and we ended up um, representing two of the five or six painters. Um, and Victor, not only did he come back, he ended up marrying one of the Americans, and Kelly, Kelly Carmody, and they actually stay, if you can believe it, at my mother-in-law's house on Shelter Island when they're painting. <laughs> my ex-mother-in-law's house. Anyhow, I love this painting because you can almost feel the boats rocking and um, that, that dark light in the foreground and then the blue, blue light of the bay. I just think this is a great picture. And this is available and it's at the gallery. He's going to have a whole bunch of new paintings. We just heard that he's driving down here um, to deliver work in the next week. Um, and he'll probably be down here painting. Um, we can look at the next slide. Just check time. Oh, this is Darius Yektai. So, you know, everybody knows my Grenning Gallery is all about artists that are classically trained, but there's something that, that's come pretty much from Fensky and also Nelson White, that, that really lush use of paint. And um, Darius Yektai is, is somebody I've known for 20 years. He's a local painter in Sag Harbor. His father was a famous abstract expressionist painter. But Megan, um, Megan Toy, my gallery manager, created the concept of thick and wet. And that was a show where we were highlighting artists that use the technique of impasto, really thick and wet. You wouldn't believe these paintings. When you see them, I, I've seen in his studio, he has tubes of paints like this big that are oil paints. And he, he, it's almost like he gobs it on with his hands. Um, and so this is much more expressionistic and abstract. But um, I think they're kind of amazing to see. And we have a lot of more contemporary homes out here. Um, and he's very much inspired by nature and he's also kind of king of the canvas in that he's creating these, these, um, uh, these compositions that are uh, very strong. Um, Darius is opening, is the next opening, June 6th. Um, he's also going to be on the cover of the Hamptons magazine. I don't know if he's on the cover, he's having a feature article in Hamptons magazine coming up. Uh, we can go to the next one. Ah, Sarah Lamb. She's, um, Sarah Lamb is like the little engine that couldn't, uh, that could. She is, she and I have known each other since I gave her her first show when she was studying at the Grand Central, or it was at the time it was the Water Street Atelier. Um, she is a delight as a person and another painter like Carl Bretzky, incredibly, incredibly um, uh, consistent 
in execution and com and composition. Oops, we lost the image. Anyhow, this painting is um, going to be um, featured. When, which one do we have her in, Megan? Do we have Sarah Lamb? Is she in the? Yeah, she's going to be featured. It, her new work will be featured July 18th. But there's kind of a backlog of orders. Like people love her work, and we do a lot of commissions. She's. Um, I'd say we get a commission a month for Sarah Lamb. So my guess is this painting will no longer be available when we get to July 18th. So um, uh, Sarah is with her um, husband and her daughter, and I think that they're driving up from Texas. They live in Texas for the school year and southeastern Pennsylvania for the winter, uh, the summer. Um, so uh, that's Sarah Lamb. And the next slide. Nope, that's it. Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Those are marvelous so, slides. Thank you. What? Marvelous slides. Yeah, and I just, you know, you, you had asked one of the other questions you asked is what can everyone do? Um, I, I appreciate like the community outreach. Um, I think that a lot of us are shopping on Amazon. And I think what we can do, because number one, as a gallery owner, but number two, as a, as a hometown Main Street business, figure out how to patronize your local vendors. Um, and, uh, and in my case, you know, you can shop online at the Grenning Gallery. Sure. Um, and there, there are, uh, we sell things from $1,000 to, I don't know, $50,000, $45,000. But um, I would recommend being very precise with your dollars. It's like you're voting for that business or that artist. Um, and I've done a fair amount of shopping online, but I, um, this is the year, I don't buy a lot of paintings from my artists, but this is the year I'm gonna do that, you know? And the other thing I would say, the other little thing I'm doing is I'm way over tipping. The velocity of money in our economy is much higher the lower down you go. I'm talking like a $20 tip for the maid yep. when she comes. I'm talking 25% yep. if I do take out food. So that's what I'm doing. Great, bravo, thank you. And now we go to Mario. Oh, he just unmuted. Excellent. We want to hear from you. Uh, t tell us, tell us what's going on with you. Uh, okay. So I recently moved to Alabama in December to slow down from the New Jersey, New York craziness. I didn't know that this was going to be upon us uh, <laughs> two months later, but it's been good. So I'm uh, currently working on an exhibition at the University of Alabama. So that's why I didn't have a lot to show. I'm kind of holding a lot of the work back. And um, I've just taken this time to Laura's point uh, to work on things that I've kind of wanted to work on uh, while things were open and busy and crazy. So I'm working on 60 by 40 watercolors. This is the second one I've done wow. uh, just yesterday. Um, and this is just yeah. a block. So I'm able to, my mind is, is settling down a little bit more, um, you know, without all the not only the things that you have to do, but the things that other people kind of just things that creep in social media. I've taken a big, bit of a break from that too, uh, just to get my thoughts together. Um, so that's what I'm doing. And I've taken this time to talk to young artists, uh, at least one young artist uh, every week on Zoom and um, just trying to advise them. I did a, a live for Windsor Newton a month ago and I got a lot of questions in the feed and I uh, mentioned that I was going to do it and I just got inundated. So I try to pick, you know, one young artist uh, a week to do that. And it's been, it's been revelatory, you know, because I wouldn't have done that without the COVID, you know, uh, it's just to make time for other people and be open. And um, I'm finding that I'm kind of connecting that way. And I'm not really a social person. So the COVID hasn't really affected me that much um, because I like being by myself. I like being in the studio painting. but that's what I'm doing. So I wish I had more work to show. Well, no, 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 that, that's great. And please tell us more about the University of Alabama exhibition. What is the plan? Is there a theme, et cetera? Yes, so, uh, so the thing, the Paul R. Jones Museum uh, is located right on the campus and it was started by an African-American art collector. Uh, so I was contacted once they found out that I was here. Um, we had a studio visit and chat and everything. And uh, they kind of like the theme of my work. So the theme is going to be kind of like a walk through history. Um, you know, a lot of the people that I paint are older African-Americans, younger African-Americans, 
so it's going to be kind of on that on that kind of bit. So I'm going to have about 20 works in the show. And what's the timetable? What, roughly, yeah. what what are they hoping for now? Yeah, now it was supposed to be uh, this month, but they're hoping for uh, probably September. Yeah. So okay. yeah. Great. Well, we'll definitely promote that when it's ready. Please keep us uh, posted. Definitely. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if everyone can turn on their mics again, now it's time to chat. Um, it's it's um, fair game. Uh, my my mind is spinning with all sorts of interesting uh, things you've said. But Katie, did you want to start us off? Is there anything that's that's burning in your mind uh, based on what you've heard? Uh, well, first, I just wanted to thank you all uh, for agreeing to do this. Peter and I kind of put our heads together. Maybe like it wasn't even that long ago. It was like two weeks ago or something, and and we were like, let's just try something. And, and it's just really uh, wonderful that everyone it responded so enthusiastically. And, um, and especially what you've all shared here just in the last um, half hour is, it, it's, I'm just, I feel really grateful to be part of such a wonderful community, but also to be able to connect in this time and, and to share, um, Feel, it feels really, I feel really lucky because I would never get to be on a call with you all like this. And in, in other times, we would just wait and see each other at an opening or whatever. And um, yeah, it feels special and really intimate to have this. So I just wanted to say thank you. And thank you for sharing and being so open. And um, yeah, in um, I'm trying to think if I have any like, questions or topics, but well, I, I'd like to touch on something uh, that's of, of keen interest to Katie, you know, that you were talking about Grand Central. Um, the fact is that um, how wonderful that Mario has been talking with young artists, yes. uh, mentoring them one by one, uh, yes. people that it sounds like he got to know through the Windsor and Newton event or possibly other avenues. Um, you know, how can we work on that? Uh, I I'm concerned about students feeling like they're at sea, lost, you know, now what? Uh, because they're disembodied. Uh, this is so much a field that involves being together and looking at a live model or whatever. Um, tell me more about that, anybody. What, what do you think we can do to help? Something Allie, that uh, I've been, sorry, Mario, I'm stepping on your toes. No, you, you, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Mario, we'll, we'll let you go, then Alia, yeah. Um, so, uh, oddly enough is, a lot of the anxiety and, and thoughts that I thought that they would have, they don't have. Hmm. And maybe the advantage of being young, yeah. um, still in this whole world of how do I contact a person to get it uh, in, a, in a magazine? Yeah. How do I get my work shown? Um, the pressures of social media, um, creating work specifically for social media. Um, that's a big thing that a lot of them are talking about. Um, and once I do get out of school, <laughs> <I'll> um, <answer. laughs> I'll break my heart. Don't do it. My mind is blown with this question, and I'm absolutely loving it. Um, and they 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 have this angst that doesn't relate to the to the COVID because a lot of them aren't paying a lot of their own bills. Um, they're worried about when they do come out of school. What? How do they get started? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm happy that a lot of the questions are about content. Um, they start talking about social media and, and nothing kind of saying anything. And I think that's why they contact me because I find um, a way most of the time, hopefully to say something personal. Right. Um, so that's where their, their angst is. So Peter, to your question, um, maybe something geared towards uh, younger people, you know, if streamline were, were to do something like that. Yep. Um, it, is, it is healing. You know, when they're able to talk about their issues and, and, and their future, it is very, it's, it's, it goes to the mental health of our young people. Yes, yes. Uh, You're here. So. Yeah. Yeah. Very okay. important. Alia. Yeah, something that I've been doing, because I know uh, just like I've had to turn everything online, a lot of our just regular school teachers have had to turn their classrooms online. And so I connected with a high school art teacher and just every once a week, every week I'm meeting with three of his classes for an hour and giving them the same lectures that I'm, well, almost the same. It's ha it has to be pared down quite a bit, 
time-wise, um, but almost the same lectures for the portrait class that I'm teaching for anybody else. Um, and they're getting information that they wouldn't otherwise get. Um, and it's also helping this art teacher who is feeling overwhelmed by just that switch to online. Um, so that's been really rewarding for me. And they're, they're contacting me privately when they want more. And it's, it's so lovely, that, it, that connection to a, a younger generation. Both my kids are in high schools and they don't, they're not interested in it. <laughs> so pay it forward to some other kids. <laughs> sure. Good. So I'd like to ask the artist a question about something really interesting that Laura said. She said that she can envision a world coming soon where galleries are by appointment. The door is not unlocked uh, and it's working for her. What do you think about that vis-a-vis -vis newcomers stumbling upon your work as opposed to people already in the swim who know Laura, know the gallery, et cetera? But I'd love to hear your thoughts. And, and it's not about Laura in particular, it's about her observation. Um, we'll start with Katie and, and work our way around to Alia and Mario. Just tell me anything that it's, yeah, I mean, the first thing that pops into my head is, is most people are discovering us through social media these days anyway, right? Yeah. So a lot of the discovery is happening online. The only thing that, um, you know, the, the, the thing that is difficult right now um, in the climate, out, even without COVID, and now everything's online, but it's you know, we just don't get to see each other's artwork in person very person. often. And it's, it's such a different experience. And obviously we all paint and sculpt in whatever media we work in to, um, for everything to be seen and experienced at scale and in an intimate setting. So, um, yeah, that's the, I think that's been the conversation for a long time is how to get people in front of the works. Um, so Can I, I know. I'll jump in for a second. It's a really good point. I don't want to lose it. To come to Laura, uh, you're so blessed to have great clients in your area that you can bring the art to. They can live with it, see what it feels like. What about a client across the country, Laura? How would that work if there's shipping involved, the risk to the art, shipping is all screwed up in this country right now. Forget transatlantic, forget it. Uh, what, what do you think about that in terms of a, a, a barrier to falling in love with the object? Well, I got to say, I mean, I have a, a pretty uh, progressive and open uh, approval program I've always had. We have not had a problem shipping, right, Megan? We haven't, we haven't had a trouble shipping. I'll come wood. Second to Megan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nope. They're just a little slower, but um, I have this situation right now. There's a $20,000 painting called Water Lilies by Darius Yektai. It is the painting that got him this show. It's a great image. And uh, there's somebody who's a, actually a senior at, at I'm not gonna say who, but she's, um, she's a senior at Stanford University and this is gonna be her 21st birthday present. Mm -hmm. She's never bought art before. And there's another painting she's interested in. So I'm going to um, ship it out there on approval and they're paying both ways. Okay. If it comes back, okay. it's on them. And we're, we, um, there are, we have a local art shipper who I think probably isn't very busy right now. Yeah. So the cost yeah. to build a crate is gonna be a little less. Um, you know, there are people, um, you know, the EHL, they were a nightmare yesterday. We couldn't get through to a human. You know, um, yep. DHL is better for shipping to Italy. We have a painting going to Italy out of this show. Mm. Uh, and the other thing is our yeah. clients are kind of psyched because we don't need to keep the show together. We can actually right. catch and carry. Normally right. you have to wait a month for your painting. And this guy bought the painting a month ago and he wants it now, so we can do that. Sure. So, sure. Um, uh, you know, that I, I, um, we've been okay. shipping paintings all around the world for years. Sure, of course. So, yeah. um, yeah, so it's not going to make that much of a difference then that, because so. you have that, that way in. Uh, Alia, yeah, and, and an artist like Mario who has a, a national reputation, people know what the painting's going to look. They don't need, they can look at the image online and make a decision in many cases because you've been showing for so many years in so many places. Right, Mario? Yeah. You're so right, Laura. You're, you're so right. You know, um, I'm, I don't want to cut in front of Alia, but... Um, Go ahead. 
I think that the creativity that the Grinning Gallery has shown um, as a brick and mortar business, um, using the technology now, when you're you're kind of forced a little bit to to kind of play jazz, and I think that that's something that galleries should maybe follow suit on, you know, because you, you need both things. People are so comfortable now with sitting there in their pajamas and shopping. Um, and that's why Amazon is so, so yeah. successful. Um, so I think, I think having a brick and mortar to actually have events and see the art in person and have a celebration of the art is important, but using the new, new technology is also um, important. That's where we're going, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, what um, I'm probably going to do at the oh. next opening, sorry, is I'm going to do 15 minute visits. You know, you'll, you'll book in. You can physically come in now because last weekend you still weren't allowed to. But I think by June we'll be able to have, you can sign up for which 15 minutes. We're also going to do a preview at the artist studio uh, the week before outside. Right. Right. I see. Smart. That's good. But that brings it into a intimacy because that space has its own magic. The artist yeah. studio. Yeah. Good. Alia, sorry. Your thoughts on no, that? No, no apologies. <laughs> I think it's fascinating. I think, um, like you all have been saying, there's so much opportunity now online, but I do work, I'm going to be the little caveat um, for us to all think about where I'm, I'm a painter, I paint for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And a gallery already is a barrier to some, some people. And, and having the door open lets everybody see my work. Anybody is, well, it's an equalizer. Um, museums sometimes have fees that makes it not possible. Yeah. It's a bus fare to get there. Um, I think, yeah, I, there's a solution for that. Um, but I, it does make me concerned. I feel like less eyes may potentially see <laughs> in the flesh. Right, now, w would you agree, all of you, perhaps that, that uh, in fact, um, those uh, gallery districts that rely upon tourists and other people going out for an ice cream cone or a nice meal in these sort of more dense areas have different challenges and advantages uh, than a, a gallery that's sort of out on its own. Uh, you know, th that idea of someone stumbling into a gallery is, is different uh, for those different scenarios. Um, and I feel like, you know, we've got to, as, as proprietors, uh, establish what is that set of conditions that we're facing. Uh, Laura's are very different from X Gallery in Jackson Hole or uh, some gallery that operates in a strip mall uh, th that's actually quite good. You know, there are plenty of galleries that are not necessarily in fancy uh, neighborhoods. Um, so I think we all have to be flexible that way and not try to come up with a blanket rule. Um, I, I think I also would like to touch on something for all of you. It has to do with internet access. Everything we've been talking about pivots on having a good digital connection. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people who don't, whether it's through poverty, through living in a location that is not that good with the connections and, and may never be in the short term, although I hope that's going to change. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that issue, including, by the way, generational? Some older people may not ever get that savvy on operating the internet? Anybody? Well, it's, it is a concern, right? But uh, how do we fix it? I have no idea. Because um, libraries are closed. That used to be where that population would go. Yeah. I don't have a solution. I wish I did. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually listening to NPR yesterday and there was a segment on, on this exact question about libraries and internet access and and um, yeah, what, how, how libraries aren't being, aren't, are kind of like in this in-between category where they're not being treated more like a school where, yeah. you know, so um, yeah, this, I, I mean, the, what, this time is so challenging, but one of the real blessings of this time is seeing all these gaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just, they're becoming so obvious. So hopefully yes. we'll, get really good solutions to some of these problems. They're coming into sharp focus, absolutely. Uh, it's a really good point. Uh, and this one clearly got, must get fixed. There's no reason that a rich country like this can't have universal, comprehensive Wi-Fi for everyone. Not necessarily free, that's not what I mean, but available at least to tap into. 
Mm-hmm. Well, don't, don't like, there is like, if you have like an, uh, in my neighborhood, if you have an optimum cable account, you can get onto the optimum Wi-Fi. And maybe part of what's going on here, maybe there should be a law that, that anybody can tap into that Wi-Fi. Yeah. Because the system's already there. there. If right. you've got a cable system, there's, there's Wi-Fi, in, at least in semi-urban. I mean, I'm kind of in the country. Um, so maybe yeah. that's something that they can, this is, there's going to be new ways of doing things that are going to last. And that should yes. be one of them. It's, it's like public. We should realize that that should be public. Good. Absolutely. No, yeah, like I, I P- think that's crucial. PBS station for online. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Now, let, let's talk a bit about the creating of artworks that register better digitally as opposed to are hard to read. Tell me about that. You know, not just scale, because you can always put the dimensions on. You can always have a person standing next to the work of art to show how big it is or how small it is. But what about texture? What about sculptures that need to be seen from different angles? Do you have any thoughts about where that takes us? Actually, this came up yesterday. Um, the, the painting that, um, uh, the bl- black and blue painting that I showed you, that is an artist that um, he has an underpainting and then there's an inch of resin or a half inch of resin and then he paints this very thick impasto on top. And the, the water lilies painting uh, I got a call from the art consultant. She needed to see the painting in a little bit more 3D because we sent all the images out. But if you've got resin, which is highly reflective, and then you've got this 3D sculpted oil paint on top of the resin, you can't see that from a flat image that's on Instagram. So um, I did a little, I, we were FaceTiming. It didn't work great. So then I did a video where you, I walked around the room looking at the painting from all the different angles. Then I walked up to the painting and I, I took my fingers and went along with an angle so you could see my hand go up and down. You could see my fingers literally disappeared inside the impasto. And then I showed her the edge of the painting, you know, with the, with the half inch of resin so she, you could see through. Um, and uh, she said, oh my God, that's great. Right. Because she wanted to show that to her client because her client, you know, what they decided was it was cheaper for her to fly from California to New York to look at the painting than to ship it out there. Yeah. But yeah. of course you might be risking your life yeah. <laughs> if you get on a plane for six hours. Right, sure. Great, that's, that's a brilliant how we worked solution. Around that. So w- would you advise then, and I'm just thinking out loud, that some artists who are facing this challenge because the work is so special in various dimensions to photograph from different angles with raking light, without raking light, et cetera, just as a matter of course, obviously they're gonna document the work of art anyway for their archive. That, that sounds like one way to go. Yeah, and I think, think also, a, I think a little video. A video, you know, sure. There's a way yeah. of storing or showing, there is a way of showing videos on, on Instagram. Sure. Instead of the still shot, just yeah. add a moving image. Do both. Yeah. And with your hand, so, so there's some idea of scale or the or a human next to it. Yeah. Anybody else on that point? I think this I think this was going on before the COVID or, or yeah. anything. Like a lot of my shows, you know, the things sell before the show really opens, or they'll see it in the American Art Collector and, and people will buy it that way. Um, and then the shows end up being like reunions, meet and greets, a uh, bunch of artists around uh not even looking at the artwork um so i think that it's, well, this just exaggerates what already was was going on in my experience well i, I mean to laura's point about you mario i mean you are a nationally known artist so there is that advantage of people knowing that the work will be good uh i think we're concerned too about the younger folks who don't have a brand uh and are needing to be seen before people fall in love uh, and obviously the stakes are lower in some regards because the pricing is, is lower, uh, but it's also going to be a bit crowded. I, I want to lead to that very point. You all are busy working. You love the fact that there's no distraction. You may be a little more settled down now when it comes to not being anxious about illness in your life or your family. There's going to be a tsunami of great work in the pipeline nine months from now, like a baby coming. Yeah. What are we going to do about that? It's going to be intense because you all need to move the merchandise at a certain point. You don't have room to store 
hundreds of finished works of art. What's on your mind? H how would you like to see that addressed in our field? Katie? Well, I'm really lucky. I have a show in September, so I, I feel super grateful for that. Um, it was supposed to be in July, but it, it was a uh, push back. Um, yeah, so I'm, I, as you can see my walls behind me, I'm hoarding, as you're saying, <laughs> everything's, uh, but I've been hoarding for a year. So, um, I mean, I don't think it's too different than what most artists are really used to because I mean, you have like little shows that you participate throughout a year usually, but then you kind of have a big show. So, you're, you know, there's always like a saving up of groups of work for, or a body of work for then a big show. Um, so I think it's maybe a really exciting time for artists to yeah. have this opportunity to make a body of connected work. Yeah and to put it out there but in terms of venues for everybody to oh. to do it that's a different story yeah. i mean hopefully hopefully the galleries will survive hopefully we will be able to um in a year show our covid creations yeah. um yeah i i mean hopefully everything could i know some some galleries have already closed and some people solo yeah. shows that were planned are are canceled and i mean i I really can't imagine how stressful that would be and disappointing, of, yeah. you know, going through like, creating such a big body of work and then not. And then finding a place to park it next. Yeah, I mean, that that's not easy because everyone has their commitments in place already. Alia or Mario, do you have any thoughts about the tsunami? Or you're not worried about it? You're just going to keep going? I, you know, for me, I, I, and what I would advise any of my students is to never let the outside world shift your, your path um, yeah. too much. Like, yeah, we have to be aware, but make the work that you need more and, and it will find a place. I, I, I just really believe that. Um, I, and the, a little bit back to the um, like painting for Instagram question. Mm -hmm that Mario's students are, are sort of itching for, I think like full, like it's dangerous to paint for just the internet because then your person, whoever sees it finally in person um, may be disappointed. And, and that's a real thing. I've gotten disappointed by some works that I thought were amazing online and then, oh man. Um, but then Norman Rockwell, right? Like he painted for print and his paintings are amazing. So. Yeah. It could go either way. Yeah. Well, yeah. actually, Peter, I would say, like, during the recession, I had a 90% drop in sales. All right? Nothing was moving. Yep. And a couple of my artists agreed to let things go for 30 or 40% off, so we, we, we stayed alive through that period. But the truth is, the economy had no impact on the really good painters. They had to paint. They were, they, their lives didn't change. They had to keep going wherever their mind was, whatever they were thinking about, the, the really, the true artists, there, it was no impact because that, they weren't painting for my gallery to sell paintings. They were painting, sure. they had to make those paintings. Right. And, and then in 2012, it didn't really, we didn't get the economy back out here until 2012. No. So that was four years four. or three and a half years of really bad times. I had a lot of great paintings. So 2012, 13, and 14 were big years for me because right. there were great paintings by great artists that had stockpiled. Mm -hmm. Yep, great. Well, it's great that you were still open to offer them. That's the key. <laughs> you know, I'm delighted you made it through because you're a great entrepreneur. Uh, and we want that for our field. No, I'm just All a stubborn, I'm just stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> you were holding on. Got it. Well. Uh, this is great. Um, I, I'm out of questions myself. Uh, if anyone wants to raise a point or comment, please do. If not, we'll begin to wrap up. Okay. All right. Um, I, I just wanted to point out a few things, if I may, uh, and I'll be doing this during our series of conversations. Uh, Streamline Publishing, which publishes Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine and issues Fine Art Today newsletter every Thursday, um, we have a few other programs that we just want folks to know about. Uh, every day, at three o'clock Eastern time, we do a three hour segment from one of the Streamline Art videos. Those are programs prepared already with master artists. 
and we essentially give away three hours to the people at home can follow along. Um, it's, it's fun because obviously there are a lot of people out there who are bored and want to improve their artistic skills. So that's something easily found on Facebook, Streamline Art Video. Um, also, we are giving away an amazing little painting by Joseph McGurl, the great landscape painter, paintinggiveaway.com. Uh, all you have to do is sign up. We just thought that, you know, we want to highlight the fact that Joe is participating not only in previous um, editions of the Plein Air Convention and Expo, but also, believe it or not, in the Figurative Art Convention and Expo this autumn. Uh, that will run from October 29th through November 1 in Baltimore, Maryland. So Joe is going to grace us with um, his presence. Uh, we have some other great artists uh, working um, to prepare for that. Figurativeartconvention.com is the website for that event. Um, I also want to point out every Friday we're doing a virtual gallery experience where you can kind of walk through the hang of a particular gallery um, and that just comes right out. You can sign up for that. It comes into your inbox. So anyway, we believe in artists. We believe in dealers. We are absolutely determined to make sure that every gallery we love endures this nightmare. Uh, and, and some are doing it brilliantly, like Laura. We applaud you. I'm glad sales are strong. Uh, you've got great artists. Uh, and we all want to take a, a page from that notebook. So thank you. And you three artists are tremendous. Keep doing the great work that you do. Um, we're all in this together. As they say, it's, it's not just a slogan, it's true. Uh, we believe in you. So thank you. We appreciate your time. Thank you. We also appreciate Dale as our technician. So signing off. Thanks again. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Love you guys.